The reading today is from John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. I tell you the truth, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in through some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger, in fact, they will run away from him, because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. All who enter through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. Let's just pray again together, shall we? Lord, as we come to your word, we thank you that uh, in this journey through the Gospel of John, you have been speaking and uh, you've been drawing us into those one-to-one relationships in the Gospel, but also into a one-to-one relationship with you. And we pray that as we continue on that journey today, that you would once again speak to our hearts, speak to our minds and speak to our wills for your glory. Amen. Well, this is the last of this present series of John's Gospel. You might say we're only halfway through, but we're just about to hit Advent and Christmas is a month away. Just thought I'd tell you that. <laughs> so, so, pretty much a month. And, uh, and so we're going into the Advent season. It's Advent Sunday next, next week, so uh, we'll be looking at that. And um, I'll take the second half of the Gospel of John as we lead into Easter which would be more than appropriate because that, that's the journey it takes us. So you'll have to hang around for the second half and, uh, and uh, be with us for that. So we're looking at that. So I'm just going to think about John 10 today and one particular theme I want us to think about. But I'm going to start with a poem. Uh, I'm from Nottingham, or one of the places I worked. I spent 11 years serving and working in Nottingham. Uh, and Nottingham in England is famous for Robin Hood. Yeah, uh, generally. It's also uh, famous for lace, Nottingham lace. Uh, But it's also famous for uh, a particular author and writer called D.H. Lawrence. And D.H. Lawrence wrote uh, Sons and Lovers. He wrote Lady Chatterley's Lover and a number of other books. But he was also a really good poet. And uh, uh, what I'd like to read to you is one of his poems today, which is called Being Alive. And I think it captures something of what I want to talk about today. This is what he says. The only reason for living is being fully alive. And you can't be fully alive if you're crushed by secret fear and bullied with the threat, get money or eat dirt. And forced to do a thousand mean things meaner than your nature. And forced to clutch onto possessions in the hope they'll make you feel safe. And forced to watch everyone that comes near you lest they've come to do you down. Without a bit of common trust in one another, we can't live. In the end, we go insane. It is the penalty of fear and meanness, being meaner than our natures are. To be alive, you've got to feel a generous flow. And under a competitive system, that is impossible, really. The world is waiting for a new great movement of generosity or for a great wave of death. We must change the system and make living free to all men, or we must see men die, and then die ourselves. Sorry for the gender specific at the end of this poem, but you'll have to go with it. It's a dated poem, but you get the point of what he's saying. And what I want to talk about today is about the power of death and the power of life. And uh, Lawrence captures something of that essence that I want us to reflect on. Here's another quotation. This is from Walter Brueggemann, uh, one of my favorite Old Testament scholars. He says this, When we think of death, we think of funerals, mortuaries, and cemeteries. But that is not what the New Testament means by death. 
It means rather a power of negation that is loose in the world and that wants to take talk us out of our lives. That power is at work all the time, not just when we are sick, infirm or old. Any day the power of death wants to talk us out of joy and energy and courage and freedom for the future. The power of death wants to convince us that there is no real future open to us. That at the best we can cope with things as they are because they're never going to change and we cannot change them. So we're going to think about the power of death because the power of death has many tools in its toolkit that are used all the time to close off our future. And the first one of those things is fear. Isn't it amazing how fear can just close things off very much for us? We've been looking at some things this morning, for example, safeguarding and abuse. We've been thinking about COVID. And I don't know about you, but I sense there's a deep anxiety at the moment in our city, in our country, and around the world because of a pandemic, and we don't know when it's going to end. And there's deep anxiety about climate change and what that's going to look like. Fear is setting in. And that's a tool that the power of death can use as it seeks to create anxiety within us. Sometimes it's fear of the other, other people coming into our country, using up our resources, taking our jobs. We hear that in the news and we hear that all over the place. Fear is a dominant thing and a great tool in the power of death. The second thing is scarcity. We think there's not enough to go round. Because there's not enough to go round, we've got to hold on to what we have and close it off to other people. And so instead of being life-giving, we become mean. And we protect ourselves and defend ourselves. We tighten up. And that leads often to greed. So we become greedy, anxious that other people may have things, so we become acquisitive. We get things for ourselves so that we are secure in ourselves and we have all the resources that we need. But of course, we then start hoarding. And as we hoard stuff, it means other people don't benefit. And that leads to exploitation. So actually, when we are prospering, somebody else is suffering somewhere in the world. There's vulnerability, and we can exploit. And, uh, and the, the power of death is seen, isn't it? In many ways, often we will build up our own, you see, countries that have much and want to protect much, have a large and significant defense, defense system because we want to defend against others intruding in that. And of course, the Romans were not exempt from that. They had a great, well, I wouldn't say it was great, but they had a great way of saying we are in control and we don't want it to be changed. And it was crucifixion. The power of death was a threat to people. There are other things also, I think, that actually are like tools in the power of death and actually... Um, affect us and destroy life too, and they're these. Unforgiveness. You know, something that has happened in our life and we close off and we, 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 um, we hold on to those wounds and we won't let go of them. And what happens is that our heart closes up to people. Resentment is another one. We see other people prospering or benefiting and we resent them. And what happens again? Our heart begins to wither. Jealousy or envy or also pride that we won't uh, give in and admit that we've going in this, we're going in this direction, that we're wrong. So we close off to any other possibility. Now, this sounds like a really depressing sermon. I don't know about you. And uh, I hope you're feeling it. But that is the power of death. And around us all the time, the world is feeding in that concept, that power of death, and making us nervous and anxious, fearful and um, acquisitive, and we have this scarcity mindset instead of an abundance mindset. Now, Jesus talks in this gospel account in John 10 about the thief. The thief is the one who comes to steal and kill and destroy. Sometimes I've, I find that people think it's Jesus who's going to come and steal and kill and destroy. That is going to kill the joy from us. I thought, you know, um, if I become a Christian, I have to become miserable. You know, or if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to part my hair in the middle and have a limp wrist, you know, or whatever. I used to think that, actually, if I became a vicar, 
you know, suddenly you have to have a parsonical voice of some kind, like, bless you, my dear, you know, or whatever. Or have a different voice when you're saying prayers or whatever. You just think that's... But actually, Jesus is not like that. It is the thief who kills. It is the thief who steals. It is the thief who destroys, as Jesus says in John 10. The word steal is klepto in Greek. It means taking something away. It means taking away your freedom. The religious leaders throughout the Gospel of John are trying to take people's freedom away. So when Jesus wants to set somebody free, if it's on the Sabbath or whenever, the religious leaders are upset. They bring their own mode of control to actually steal the freedom from people, the life from people. But we are free to love, and we're free to give out to others, and to welcome others, and to express hospitality. Jesus is a life giver. The second word is kill, which in Greek is thuo, which means to sacrifice. But actually in this, the sacrifice is you. That's what the thief wants to do. Sacrifice you for the thief's benefit. So it's killing you, destroying you. And that's what the religious leaders were interested in. They weren't interested in the person. You take the story, for example, of the woman caught in adultery. Are they interested in her well-being? Absolutely not. What they're interested is in making a point, and they'll sacrifice the woman at the expense of making that point. Or the man born blind, for example. Are they really interested in the fact that this man who's been blind all his life suddenly sees? No. They're annoyed because Jesus has healed him. You know, and so what do they do? They, they end up casting him out of the synagogue. This person who sees for the first time and is liberated, he's cast out. This is, this is the mindset of the thief who wants to steal and kill and destroy. And destroy is apolimi which means to cause to perish or to cause to lose. And again, it's you that um, the thief wants to do. And of course, the scarcity and fearful mindset often leads to a wrong perception of what I call contamination, religious contamination. There is a mindset amongst the religious leaders as if you go to somebody who is unclean, say, like in religious terms in those days, the leper, if you touch the leper, you were contaminated. That is the power of death at work. So what does it lead to? It leads to alienation of the person who's a leper. What Jesus did, though, was reach down and touch the person because he knew that if he touched the person, the infection would operate the other way. His goodness would flow out into the person and bring healing. So the power of death is fearful that you'll be contaminated. But the power of life that Jesus brings is life-giving into situations and renews and transforms people. So Jesus says, it is the thief who comes to kill and steal and destroy, in John 10.10. 10. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. That's one, well, that's what's on offer. Jesus is an abundant life giver. And often I think our mindset about what Jesus wants to bring to your life and to my life is way too small. I think it was George MacDonald who was C.S. Lewis's mentor. He's a Scottish writer. George MacDonald said, you know, when we invite God into our lives, when we invite Jesus into our lives, what we think is that we're inviting him into, into our nice cozy terrace. And uh, we sit down in our little house and we think, oh, Jesus is coming. Is there room on the sofa? You know, and then, uh, oh, he's not going to like that picture on the wall. You know, so he's probably going to say, you need to get rid of that picture on the wall. It doesn't, it's not very appropriate, David, you know, or whatever. Or he's not going to like, you know, that, that, that photograph over there or whatever. You've got to shift that. So we feel uncomfortable about those things. But actually, when Jesus comes into our little cozy terrace, he says this, I want to, let's go out 50, 50 meters here. You say, what? Let's go up four floors here. You say, what are you talking about, Jesus? He says, you've invited me in. The only place fit for me as a king is a palace. I want to build a palace. I want to set free. Let's take the walls out. Let's expand. And we think, so many of us, when we think we're going to follow, we want to follow Jesus, that actually is going to stifle the life in us, 
rather than expand the life in us. And he wants to expand. I, I was sharing about some of my nervousness. You know, I thought, if I completely surrender my life to Jesus, he's going to send me to a foreign country far away and um, where I'll have no friends. Well, the first half of that actually has happened. <laughs> I'm in a foreign, not quite foreign, but I'm in a different country. But in fact, that's the mindset, isn't it? If I surrender my life to Jesus, he will sort out these few little bit of things here that he wants to get rid of. But actually, he just wants to blow my life open into a new way, liberate me, set me free, and bring wholeness. He gives you an exceptional life. That's what he's offering. In contrast, again, I come back to when I, I was on the journey of being ordained as a vicar, and you get this kind of ring of confidence stuck around your neck or whatever. Uh, I, you know, I used to think, oh, I'm going to have this pious voice. I'm going to have a limp wrist. I'm going to all this kind of stuff, all that kind of thing. And then I suddenly realized, actually, God said to me, no. I remember thinking, why does this have to be so? If God is the creator of the whole universe, the beautiful detail of every plant, every flower, every insect, everything that's in this universe is in incredibly amazing. The stars and constellations and galaxies that we can barely see with our eye. God has brought it into being. Why am I going to be the same and just merge like a miserable community of miserable people who have no hope? Jesus wants to give you an exceptional life. You are exceptional. There is no one quite like you. If you take a look around and look at the people, you might be quite thankful there's no one quite like you. But there is no one quite like you. You are unique. He gives you an exceptional life. And instead of sacrificing you, he sacrifices himself. That's what he offers. Now, um, uh, uh, forgive me if you wanna, if you're a farmer in the midst here. Because um, I, uh, I've got a confession to make. When I was a student, I, I, I was invited to come and help work on a farm. And being a townie, I wasn't particularly good at it. But there were a group of us who were asked to kind of uh, bring this herd of uh, cows down through the farm and uh, bring them out to another field. And uh, so we weren't particularly very good at it, but we took them, down, took them all down through the farm, led them down through the farm. We had to go past the slurry pit, which was full. But unfortunately, we allowed a cow to fall in the slurry pit. So it was pretty messy. And uh, I don't know whether the cow was either floating or swimming, but it was just, it was down in there. So we had no idea what we were going to do. So I had to go and get, um, we had to send one of our team to go and get the farmer who was putting his feet up and having a cup of tea, probably regretting it at this moment. And he, he, he came down and uh, in the end, he got his tractor and he had to climb into the slurry pit and pass a, ba a band underneath this cow, and then lift it out with his colleague, and pull it out. But I still have this image of him in this slurry pit, and this cow being lifted out, and he was like almost underneath it, coming out like this, and it was just like the image of the cross. And I, I remember thinking at the time, this is just like Jesus. You know, we made such a mess. This world is like a slurry pit. And what God does is he climbs into the pit, gets underneath us, and he lifts us up on the cross. And on the cross, he sets us free. He lifts us out of the mess and gives us a new life and a new beginning. That's what's on offer. Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the full. He's come to lift us out of the slurry pit. He defeats the power of death and leads us and bestows upon us a resurrection life. Isn't it time that we, as the people of God, started to choose life? Oh, a little bit of a response there. <laughs> I'm just going to finish with a story that actually is a true story. It happened to me about six, seven years ago now. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And uh, while I was going through the process of getting the um, some tests for that because I knew that it wasn't, there was something wasn't right, um, uh, and I'd gone for uh, various tests, a biopsy, etc. I got this letter from the consultant that just sort of said it was a whole big bland of uh, writing, and the only word I could see on that whole letter that was full was just the big C word, 
cancer. That's all I could see on this letter, cancer. And it's like gripping. And, um, and then, of course, you know, as you go through the process, you know, eventually they're going to give you a conclusion. And now one day, I was, I was serving at the time, leading a community in, in England uh, at a place called Lee Abbey. We had a community of about 100 people. So I was responsible for that community, mostly younger people and so on. Um, and they knew that I was going through this process. And eventually I got a phone call. I picked up the phone and I answered it. And there was the receptionist from the hospital saying, uh, uh, we were expecting you for an appointment today. And I said, oh, I said, if I'd known I had an appointment, I would have been there. But they'd either forgotten to send the letter or it got mislaid or something, but it never came to me. So I, so I thought, oh, I need to arrange another appointment. And I said, well, well when can I uh, uh, make another appointment? And they said, well, can you come now? And then I knew there was something not right. You know? I said, well, I'm 45 minutes away from the hospital. Still come now. So I'm, I, I have Pixies operating a, a tea shop, coffee shop, and uh, in, in as part of the Lee Abbey community and so on. I just had to get in the car on my own and drive this 45 minutes, a long 45 minutes, and your mind is in turmoil. You're thinking, oh my goodness, what does this mean? What's the consultant going to say? I still remember that big word you know, on that letter and so on. So I get to the hospital, and uh, I go into the, into the hospital waiting room, and I say to the receptionist that I'm here. And, uh, and she said, oh, great, could you just take a seat in the waiting room, and the consultant will see you when he's free. So I'm sitting there. Can you imagine what that's like? Some, some people may have been in that situation and uh, can imagine it. But just imagine what that's like. You're thinking C, the big C. You know, how's that going to affect? I've got to wait and I've got to get this conclusion. So I'm sitting down thinking, I need to do something. I need to, to think, get my head around this. So I have on, on my iPad and on my phone various books and readings and that kind of thing. I thought, what have I got? And I've got Henri Nguyen's. Uh, Bread for the Journey, which is a brilliant book, by the way. It's just short readings and reflections. And I thought, oh, that Henri Nguyen, he's pretty good. He'll calm my nerves while I'm sitting in the waiting room. Okay, so this is August the 30th on the year, um, uh, six, six or seven years ago. And I, I turn it up for the day. And the title for this, on this day, I'm sitting in a hospital waiting room thinking he's going to tell me I've got cancer is this. Choosing life. That's the title. And there's a verse that goes with it, all right? Remember the scenario, what I'm doing in the hospital waiting room? This is the verse. God says, I'm offering you life or death, blessing or curse. Choose life then so that you and your descendants may live. Is that not relevant? Yeah. Except it's making me more nervous, I can tell you. What does this mean? And then the next thing says, choose life. So Ham, I think I better read this. So this is what it said. God says, I'm offering you life or death, blessing or curse. Choose life then so that you and your descendants may live. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Choose life, writes Henri Nguyen. That's God's call for us. And there's not a moment in which we do not have to make that choice. Life and death are always before us. In our imaginations, our thoughts, our words, our gestures, our actions. Even in our non-actions. This choice for life starts in a deep interior place. Underneath very life-affirming behavior, I can still harbor death thoughts and death feelings. The most important question is not, do I kill? But, do I carry a blessing in my heart or a curse? The bullet that kills is only the final instrument of the hatred that began in the heart long before the gun was picked up. So I'm sitting there. And actually, I have to say, I had a conversion experience. It was an unusual conversion experience because it was this. I'm sitting in a hospital waiting room thinking about myself and thinking, you know, I'm fearful. And the scarcity mindset gets, sets in. I'm worried about that. And God comes in and he says, David, I'm not worried about you. I want you to think about others. So I want you to think about the consultant that you're going to have to see, and he's got the horrible job of telling you that you've got cancer. How are you going to bring life into that situation? Look around at the, the hospital waiting room. These people are anxious. How would you bring life to those people? And what about the people back in the community that you're leading? Because they know you've gone to the hospital. You're going to have to go back, and you're going to have to tell them. How will you bring life to those people? 
So it was a transformative moment for me because it took me out of thinking about myself and fearful for myself and thinking I need to be a life giver to others, even in the midst of the shadow of death. I often forget to tell you what happens about my cancer. So then people come to me afterwards and say, what happens? I was, I'm still here. Okay, that's good. I had to have surgery, and uh, uh, it's uh, up, up until today. I'm very thankful it's all clear. But actually, that was such an important moment from God for me. And I want to put that to you today. We sit here and we worry about our future. We worry about climate change. We worry about COVID. We worry about all kinds of things you might be worrying about. Whether you've got enough money stored up for the future, you're worried about your grandchildren or your, your kids or whatever, what kind of future is that? And God says to you and I today, I have come that you may have life. You choose life. Choose to bring a blessing, not a curse. And choose to reach out of yourself to those around you and be life-giving this week. That can be in all kinds of different ways. So if you're on the street and somebody's distressed, if you manage a shop or you, you work as uh, in whatever situation, the people around you or whatever, why not think, actually, God, let me be a life-giver in those situations this coming week. See what God will do with you. Because I think that when you choose life, which is giving life to others, you receive life back for yourself in fullness and joy and in abundance. So let's pray. Just as we're still, it's uh, I want you to imagine the risen Christ standing before you and he is saying, I just have this image of the Matrix in my head. I don't know if you've ever seen the film The Matrix. It's like offering two, two pills. And actually, Jesus is standing with his hands open to you. He's got scarred hands. And he's in his risen presence. And he's offering you life or death. And he's saying, choose life. And consciously now. If you feel ready to do that, say to Jesus in the quiet of your hearts or just gently whisper it to him now, I choose life. Jesus, I choose life for this week. I choose life onwards. Keep that choice before me that I may be a life giver. Amen.